Hey, Holly here. Before we dive into this week's episode, I wanted to share some information with you about some workshops that we're running. Here at Ashore Product Science, we love to teach workshops, both public workshops, private workshops at companies, and even an online workshop for people who can't come to see us in person. If you're interested in learning how to identify the right products and features to build and how to develop the support to do so with the product science method, come and join us. You can learn more at ashoreproductscience.com slash workshops. Hi, and welcome to the Product Science Podcast, where we're helping startup founders and product leaders build high growth products, teams, and companies through real conversations with people who have tried it and aren't afraid to share lessons learned from their failures along the way. I'm your host, Holly Hester Riley, founder and CEO of H2R Product Science. This week on the Product Science Podcast, I'm excited to share an, another conversation with Marty Kagan. Marty's new book, Empowered, has just come out, and I wanted to hear more about the the story behind the book and the topics that are in it. So welcome, Marty. Thanks very much, Holly. So um, I'm sure our listeners already know who you are and they've heard about your journey before because you've been on the podcast before, but let's talk a bit about the story of this book. What what led to you writing Empowered? Yeah, sure. Well, um, officially the work started two years ago. It was a two-year effort, but uh, what had happened was three years ago, the second edition of Inspired came out. Mm -hmm. Um, The first edition uh, was basically just in the smaller tech community, but the second edition of Inspired was distributed by a big publisher in New York, and the result was it went a lot further than the first edition. And of course, product had grown in that 10 years. Uh, And that was great, of course. Lots more people exposed to the ideas. Lots more people telling me now they understand what product is and they love this. The problem was uh, very early, I started hearing from teams that they wanted to work the way it's described, good teams work. And but they they weren't allowed to. They literally didn't. Sometimes they were literally uh, prevented. Uh, but more often, their company didn't really have a place. They don't really even have a place for product discovery in general. The the way they work was, uh, they are handed roadmaps and they're told just design the features, implement the features as fast as you can. And of course, that's sort of not discovery. That is a little bit of design. (laughs) That's a lot of coding. And it kind of misses the point of making sure that product comes up with a solution that really works. It's valuable, usable, feasible, viable. And I um, I started meeting with the leaders of those companies and asking them, you know, like, you said you want to work like the best companies. You do realize that's not how they work. And let's, so let's try to understand why and what it would take. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I started realizing what was really going on is while Inspired talked about the best practices for teams, Mm -hmm. there really wasn't anything out there that talked about how leaders at good companies work and need to work. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at how they were doing the job of quote product leadership, really in their case, just managing these feature teams versus what a good product leader does at a good product company, the difference was so dramatic that I realized, well, this may even need a book, not just, I was thinking originally some articles, uh, which I started by writing some articles and, uh, and, they resonated. That was the good part. But what it really did was it exposed the tip of the iceberg, really, that they didn't know. Look, they didn't really even know what product vision was uh, and let alone how to do it. They didn't know really anything about product strategy. And most of them Mm -hmm. had no product strategy. They were just trying to please as many stakeholders as possible. They didn't know anything about team topology. How do we structure our product teams? Uh, to meet the needs, they were basically just kind of going with what they've had for a long time, dealing with technical debt. You know, they, they just were sort of stumbling along on that front. And they certainly didn't know how to assign work in a way to their teams that let their teams be empowered to solve those problems. So mm-hmm. you know, I was looking at this realizing, oh my gosh, that's not this big a problem. That is like this big a problem. And, uh, I had to decide. I, I remember I did a um, talk at um, Mind the Product Hamburg two years ago, and I sort of 
did an MVP of what this concept would be to see how uh, it resonated. Cause this is a big topic. And, you know, I got a lot of feedback that people are like, we don't know this stuff. We need help with this stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, I got to work, which, you know, unfortunately books are massive projects and they're old school projects. You know, you ship a physical thing and you can't change it. So there very much reminds me the old days of shipping shrink wrap software, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's two years later and it finally came out. So um, that's where we're at. Yeah. I think that one of the things in there that you said that I'm the most curious about is when you were earlier on in, in the, the, the journey towards this book and you were asking the, the people you were meeting or the product leaders you were meeting, if they had an idea that they were, you know, that they were not working like the best product companies. And did they see that? Like, did they see that? How, how many of them saw that? And what, what was that like? Yeah, it's really amazing to me. They almost all of them did see it. And, you know, one of, it's, one of the things that's funny is, you know, there's all these books that are out there that I think are very good, by the way, really good, that, that make the argument for empowered teams. Um, and they're, they're aimed at, you know, they're aimed at CEOs. They're, they're like, turn the ship around, if you've ever seen that one, or team of teams around special forces in the military, or, um, or the brand newest one that I love is uh, from the found, co-founder of Netflix, Reed Hastings, No Rules, Rules. But there's all these books that make the argument that if you really want to get the talent of your people, you know, work like Google, work like Amazon, they have, but and m- most of the time, they not only knew of that, but they kind of had read at least a few of them and liked them. But when I asked, like, well, okay, then what's the problem? Well, the problem is they didn't trust their teams. Mm-hmm. They felt that, you know, they don't have the caliber people that other companies do, that, that the good companies do, which is explicitly why I, I chose the subtitle I did on the book Empowered, which is Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products, because that was sort of the missing piece of the puzzle that I think that so many of those leaders didn't know. They thought, unless you hire these, you know, rock star type, you know, they have to come from MIT or Stanford before to, in order to do, but of course that is not the case at any of those companies. They might've been like at Google for their first few hires, but not at scale, not for a long time. And so what, what I point out to them is no, they have the same people. In fact, in many times I've been in introducing people from companies like yours that where they're not happy into those companies and seeing how great they could do. Mm-hmm. And so to, uh, to me, it was very clear. It wasn't about that. It was about how they were using their people, the environment yeah. that they were providing. In fact, I, one of my favorite quotes is Bill Campbell, coach Bill Campbell's quote about the job of leaders is to provide, is to realize there's a greatness in everyone and to provide an environment where that greatness can shine. That's mm-hmm. paraphrasing, but that's what he's, he's basically saying. And, and he literally coached, you know, Bezos and Steve Jobs and Larry and Sergio on exactly that point. Your job is to provide an environment where people can do good work. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and in fact, I ended up dedicating the book to Bill Campbell because so many of the principles that, uh, that I found in the best companies were really coming from him. Mm. Yeah, that really resonates with me. I, I, I'm sure a lot of people have this, but I have my own, you know, times where I went into a new company and I talked to the leaders and I said, you know, why are you, why are you working in this way? And they'd be like, well, we don't, we, our people aren't good enough for us to do it that way. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, like, they're not going to be if you don't give them a chance. Um, so what, uh, what are some of the first things that you do, you know, so say you're talking to some of these people who think their people weren't good enough to, to do it this way. How do you start to show them that that's not the problem? Well, I sh- first of all, I, I like to show them, uh, uh, show them the backstory on products that they are impressed with. So one of the uh, sort of tools I use a lot is I know a lot of the teams and I know a lot of the backstories like, okay, how they came up with this product. And, um, 
because they do acknowledge the products are great, <laughs> but you know, to them, it's like a black box of all these super, super scientists or something behind the scenes. And so you show them more behind the scenes and then you show them, okay, let's look at the product strategy they had and let's compare that to what you have. And, and you can start to see how they're getting so much more out of their people than you are. So yeah, yeah I find that works well, especially because uh, each leader seems to have a, there's a few companies that really do, uh, they respect. And if I can figure out who those companies are, and, and they're usually a consistently innovative company, and I share more of their philosophy, more of their mantras, so that they can relate to that. But it, usually it's not, you know, it's not that hard to get them to the point where they can at least be willing to try it you know, at least with a try it with a team or two. But, you know, there's more than I then I start telling them, you need to really make sure you have the leaders in place that can, uh, that can make sure these people know how to do these jobs. Mm-hmm. We talk about the role of coaching and staffing. And so it's, you know, it, it changing a company from working in the sort of conventional ways to the ways really good companies work is a big journey. That's non-trivial. It's not, it it may be the root of the issue may be the leader's lack of trust, but the fix for the issue is uh, it it impacts the leaders. It starts with the leaders. Yeah. And, And it takes a long time. It's not something they can just change, you know, in a week. Exactly. So tell me more, you know, you mentioned product strategy and having them look at how, how the, the companies they admire, um, how their product strategy it works and, and then look at their own. What, what are the components or how do you identify a good product strategy? What do you expect to see? Yeah, well, and in fact, I ended up, um, I've had some examples that I've used for a while that really seem to resonate. I ended up putting it in the book, in fact, even though um, you know, I hesitate to kind of shine a light on bad companies. Uh, it's easier to, to talk about good companies than, than uh, bad ones by name, but there is uh, a very well-documented quote product strategy from a company you probably remember, Pandora. Pandora was a music service or one of the early ones, and, and, uh, uh, and there's a whole story about I think they made a huge mistake going public with just a few engineers. And a lot of that was sort of the root of the issue, but they had, they published their product strategy. And if you looked at it for even 30 seconds, you realize it's not a product strategy at all. Their Mm -hmm. whole strategy was try to please as many stakeholders as possible. Mm -hmm. And, and they didn't even really tackle that. So what they did is they just basically let the stakeholders, he gave them funny money and let them buy features and mm-hmm. anyway, I'm like, okay, look at that. That may be more, more blatant than you have, but it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. That's all they're doing is just their feature teams. They're trying to please as many stakeholders as possible. And you notice there's no real innovation at all. Yeah. And even more to the point, you could argue because they had such a small investment in engineers and product in general, that they needed to be especially smart in how they used those people yeah and so absolutely. that was that's an argument for a very good product strategy not the absence of a product strategy so and, and that's what so many companies do now most of them don't play silly games with funny money to kind of allocate the features but that's what they they essentially are are letting stakeholders there's some allocation and they do as many features as they can and they are sorry they can't please everybody and that's Um, you know, and then I contrast that for them with now let's look at a real product strategy, the way a good product company works. They know they can't do everything. So they make some hard decisions around focus. What are the things that really matter? So like at your stage of the company with a lot of startups, so like you need to realize the only thing that matters is product market fit right now. You don't have it. And so you are thrashing uh, trying to do 50 different things and making a progress on none of them. So yeah. first, a part of product strategy is focus. Then I'm like, okay, so now you focus on product market fit, but what do you do? 
Well, mm-hmm. now you need to get serious. This is where product leaders earn their money. We need to do, we need to look for insights. Those insights can come from the data. That's the most common example. They can come from talking to your customers. They can come from new enabling technology. They can come from industry analysts and, and the competitive landscape. But you need to decide how are you going to really uh, zero in on the levers that will make the difference for your product. And then, of course, you have to turn that into work. Uh, you know, any product strategy turns into execution and that is the problems that need to be solved and then you want to assign those problems to product teams in a way that is empowering and not you know command and control so if you just hand them a list of features that's command and control you're telling them this is the solution whether or not they agree or not build this and so we talk about the alternative and yeah, um, product strategy is kind of right in the thick of it. That is right in where everything comes together. So I do spend a lot of time on product strategy. You know, it's also true. That was the area of the book I was most hesitant to talk about in the book because I had, for the last 20 years, I had felt that product strategy was something I had to do face-to-face, one-on-one with the product leaders, you know, on with a whiteboard, with their dashboard of their data. And so I didn't know if I'd be able to describe how product strategy is done in a general enough way that it could be done by anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, that was one of the hardest parts of the book to write. But, uh, but I felt pretty good about how that came out because a, a lot of product leaders um, that I really respect for those that don't know that, listen, you were one of them, you know that, but your <laughs> listeners may not know that. Um, you know, I wanted to see, did it make sense to them and uh, seemed to go pretty well. Yeah. I think product strategy is is like one of the absolute most important things that I see missing from so many companies that I, that I work with and so many product managers that I talk to that come to me and they're like, you know, my my product leader is just asking me to build these features and there's no strategy to it. And it's such a shame to see so many product people working in that environment. And, you know, I, I always tell them to step up and like, just try to, you know, if they're not seeing it, like start crafting what they think it should be like form an opinion on it. Like, even if you're not yet at a place where you expect that opinion to be heard, like you should start forming that. And it's all about the focus, right? Like people try to do too many things. So uh, you named a lot of things in there that are really important. So obviously there's a lot to, to um, coming up with a good product strategy, but then you also mentioned giving that product strategy to the teams in a way that empowers them rather than just turning them into feature teams and telling them build this. What are some of the techniques that you use for that? Well, let's say, you know, in your product strategy that you come out of the product strategy and, and the big, let's just say the big thing you've got to really fix is the onboarding process for your product. Okay, that's one of a few really big problems that have to be fixed in order for the whole thing to work well and company to have good unit economics, let's say. And so uh, there's really fundamentally two ways you can do that. One way is the leader or whoever says, okay, we need to fix onboarding. I know what to do. Here are the 10 things you need to do. And, you know, that's basically a roadmap. It might be coming from the product leader instead of the stakeholders, but it's still a roadmap of features and projects. On the other end, you know, teams can do it. And some percentage of those will probably help, but most won't. And the team certainly won't feel ownership of it because they're not. They don't have ownership of it. On the other hand, the good way, uh, and ironically, the way OKRs were intended to be used is that you, uh, you say, okay, here's the problem. You go to one or more teams, product teams. There's no reason you can't assign a hard problem to multiple teams. That's often what good companies do. But you go to one or more teams and say, okay, we need you to focus on the onboarding problem. It's not good today. It takes... 40 days on average for a customer to onboard. That's not scalable for us. uh, And our customers aren't happy. The way we measure this is, well, how long it takes and maybe also something like churn rate or something that's uh, else. And so what we need you to do is look at that problem and you as a team, figure out the best way you think to solve that problem. 
And that's your problem. This quarter, tell us what you can do. Maybe this quarter you can make it from 40 days down to 30 days. You tell us. But that's the problem we need you to really own. And then the team looks at the, you know, they look at all the data. They look at all the customer. They talk to customers. Hopefully they watch them interact. And then they're like, yeah, we, we're going to work on this problem. We've got lots of ideas. We're not sure, of course, if they're honest, they'll say, we're not sure exactly which ideas will work, but we know that ultimately our job is to improve that onboarding. Yeah. Yeah, that resonates so well. Like I literally just went through that experience of, of a leader wanting to hand over, um, you know, these are the things, let's decide what needs to be built and and these are the things and then being like, oh, well, like, let's, let's get the whole team. Let's give the team the problem. But it's so it's, I guess, to those of us who've worked in an environment where teams are given the problem, it seems surprising that it's so hard for, for leaders to do that. Do you have any insights as to like, why it's so hard for leaders to to work that way? Oh, yeah. I mean, at this point, look, the, the, the classic way over the last, what, 100 years, I'm not even sure when it started, is command and control. Uh, it's it's the been the style, you know, that's sort of the industrial revolution was all sort of built on the backs of a command and control management style. Uh, and honestly, this is... Um, it's still, I meet people that just graduate business school and they don't, they don't say, oh, I was trained in command and control, but they've been indoctrinated in command and control. It's, they, they've been brainwashed into this model. And so you have to say, you know, that is not the only way to work. That is not even the good way to work. Now you could argue that if you're a manufacturing company and you're trying to consistently deliver 1 million of the identical things every day. Okay, I don't know enough about that world to say, but you know, that's where it came from. That's where the the mindset came from. But I can tell you if your business is driven by innovation, this is the antithesis of what we want and need. Um, I mentioned a book that just came out recently by Reed Hastings, the co-founder of Netflix called No Rules Rules, uh, which is kind of a provocative title, but they're describing how Netflix was built on a culture of empowerment. It is like set the dial all the way to 10 on one to 10 in terms of empowerment, because it really is a spectrum. But uh, Mm -hmm. And in the book, they talk about a mantra that's been at uh, Netflix from the beginning. It was uh, credited to Leslie Kilgore, you may remember, she was one of the early executives at Netflix Mm -hmm. and um, still on the board. But anyway, the mantra is lead with context, not control. And I found I loved that mantra it just uh, resonated perfectly with me. I had no nobody I know at Netflix had told me that mantra before. So that was new for me. But uh, I loved it. Because yeah, so that's short for don't tell people what to do in a command and control sense. Don't hand them that solution. Tell them the context, tell them the problem, tell them the data we have, like what's the unit economics on this product, tell them the challenges, tell them the constraints that are out there. That gives the teams much, that gives them the information they need in order to come up with the best solution to this problem. And uh, they try extremely hard. You could argue the entire company was built around optimizing for empowered teams. And I, and I also find it just personally fascinating to watch how that model has then uh, migrated and applied to creating content. Mm. Of course, what Netflix has done incredibly well, which many people thought, of course, oh, they know how to do technology, but they have no idea how to create, you know, a, a film or a, a series. But of course, they they do. It has worked remarkably well. Yes. Yeah. Um, that book I've heard other people recommend it to me just in the past week. So I'm definitely going to read it. <laughs> um, yeah. So one of the other things that you mentioned earlier on that I wanted to dive a little deeper into is uh, team topology, because I think that's something that there's not enough content and writing out there on. It's kind of hard for people to get info. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I, and the reason there's not much written on it, because it's a really complicated topic. Uh, that's why. And it's also one of those topics that is not 100, 
it's not purely a product topic. It spans product and technology. Uh, in fact, the only way I know to do a good team topology is when you take when you get the engineering leaders together with the product leaders and they solve this together because it's sort of by definition where those come together. Um, and of course, what this really is, is, is the non-issue if you're a very early stage startup, if you've got like less than a dozen engineers, then basically the company equals the product team, you're done. But at once you start growing, once you get 20, 30, but then when, especially when you get hundreds of engineers and now you have, you know, 40, 50, 100 product teams, now the question of how do you break up that work so that every team feels ownership of something meaningful uh, and they, ha- they feel also largely autonomous. What Autonomy is a little different than empowerment. Empowerment says you are able to figure out the best way to solve the problem. Autonomy says you have the resources and the skills you need on your team in order to do whatever you need to do. And of course, at scale, nobody has full autonomy just like nobody really has full empowerment in the sense that we, we don't get to change like the business purpose. We don't get to change the uh, pricing usually, things like that. So we all have constraints. That's fine. What we're trying to do is optimize for empowerment. Uh, so mm-hmm. we're trying to minimize uh, dependencies. We're trying to maximize autonomy. We're trying to align teams with customers. We're trying to align teams with parts of the business. So there are, un, there are all these factors. The biggest factor I didn't even mention yet, the biggest factor for team topology is usually, uh, well, really two. Number one is the vision, the where you're trying to end up. So if you don't have a topology that helps you get there, it's going to get in the way of you getting there. Mm-hmm. And then the, the second one, which is also a derivative of the vision, is the architecture. Because, of course, the the architecture plays a tremendously outsized role in team topology because architecture either enables teams to have the level of, uh, well, another famous principle around team topology you've probably heard is highly aligned, loosely coupled. That's what we want with Mm -hmm. product teams. We want them highly aligned so that, like, we are... Um, all going in exactly the same direction, but we're also not so tied to each other. Team topology is one of those things that's really easy to see when you have a bad one. If every team complains to you that even making a small change requires working with all the other teams and you know, no, nobody is really able to feel ownership of anything. We're all just a small, this is what I hear from so many companies that don't have a intentional team topology. They say that we're just a little cog in a giant wheel. We don't really own anything meaningful. We're like one little step in a user journey and we can't really impact anything. That's like not a good topology. But that the architecture, you know, the architecture implies where the dependencies are. Teams end up either fighting an architecture or aligning with an architecture. And so we would much rather have the, uh, that's why we really need those engineers there because they know the architecture and they influence the architecture and we can align the architecture with our team's needs. And, uh, and that's really where we get a good team topology from. There's no perfect team topology, just like there's no perfect 100% autonomy at scale, but there are some really good practices. And uh, in the book, I share a lot of best practices of, uh, in order to end up with a highly empowered set of teams. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a lot about trade-offs, a lot of, you it's know. A lot about trade-offs. Absolutely. But intelligent trade-offs. And that's where, you know, you really do need your engineering counterparts with you. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other things that was different in this book is you shared stories of uh, product leaders and they're, um, you know, like in, in Inspired, you shared stories of product managers. But in this case, the product leaders come from different disciplines. Um, tell me about that. Yeah, I wanted to show, uh, I, I 
you know, the, the, this is the thing about the tech industry. It's really, in many cases, a cult of personality. Everybody knows the founders. Everybody knows the CEOs. They get all this attention. And I've always been uh, more interested in the, the people behind these products. Always been more interested, you know, the engineers, the designers, and the product managers, especially product managers. They're often, you know, they're they're just not seen. The, they're you know, the attention goes to the seniors. But I also think that's true with most of the leaders as well, product leaders. And so I wanted to shine a light on good product leaders. And when I say product leaders, I mean the managers and leaders of product management, product design, engineering, and the company. So I ended up picking eight product leaders, two that lead design, two that lead engineering, two that lead product, and two that lead companies. And um I just, uh, well, I've known them all, and I think they're all really good examples of what we look for in a leader, somebody who really cares and, and shows this every day, how much they care about staffing and coaching their people, especially coaching. And I wanted to show that, uh, you know, in, in great companies, these leaders this is really what they're good at. They come from all kinds of backgrounds, which is true with product and design and even engineering today. They come from many different backgrounds, but they all are the kind of people that really know how to develop teams. They know the power of teams. They're sort of secure enough in their own contribution that they're not afraid to shine a light on the team. Uh, which of course, as you know, there's a lot of egos in our industry and and and, uh, so, and a lot of them, that gets in the way of their ability to be a good leader. So yeah, I wanted to shine a light on some great leaders. And fortunately, I, you know, I know a lot of them and there are a lot of really good leaders. And uh, I wanted people to know not just how good companies work, but what it's like to work for one of these people. Because that's what, mm -hmm. of course, I'm hoping. Yeah, I love that. And I think that there are so many great um there's so many great people in the industry that don't get the attention and that we don't hear their stories enough and we don't hear enough about how they do their jobs and we can learn so much from them yeah. so it's one of the things i hope to do with this podcast right it's it's all about finding people that you know maybe we haven't heard from all of them yet and um it's fantastic to hear new stories yeah well i would encourage any of those eight leaders i uh mention that i profile in the book would be a great uh person for your podcast yeah, absolutely. I think I will definitely be be getting more of them on here. So I know we just have a couple of minutes left. Are there other topics in the book that that you are uh, really want a chance to share with our listeners? Uh, well, we talked about a lot of them. It's you know, it's the product leadership, the leaders and managers of these areas. These are hard jobs. These really are hard yeah. jobs, and. A lot of people that have not played this role, they are pretty surprised when you describe what they're really responsible for, because the difference, I mean, it's not like they weren't working hard hours or anything, but the what they do during their day is so different. Um, in fact, when I tell first level managers that more than 50%, at least 50% of their time should be on coaching their people, they're like, oh my gosh, it's not even in my top three right now. And mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're often like, oh, what do I do? I mean, I don't understand how I'm going to get from here to there. There's a, there's a big difference. So and really, this is the key difference for your individual contributors on the teams. It often does require them raising their game, but it's still the job, same job. But for the leaders, it's it's really a very different role they're playing for their company and, and need to play. So I do try to acknowledge that it's a very hard job. Mm -hmm. And that it's not one of the other things I try to point out is if you're, if you think your job is to please everybody, you won't really like this job <laughs> It is not about that. Now you should be very transparent. You don't want to be arbitrary. You don't want to be viewed as some, you know, dictator. You are uh, being very open about how you make decisions about the transparency of the data, about why you're focusing on certain areas. But fundamentally, there are a lot of choices that have to be made by these leaders in order to make move the needle on the important things. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it is, there's so much, there's so much not pleasing people. <laughs> you really have to have, a, you know, a, a strong spine, I think. Yeah, there was a great quote. I didn't put this in the book, but there's a great Steve Jobs quote um, about this, which is if, if you want to please people, don't be a product leader, sell ice cream. Mm. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Um, awesome. Well, this has been a, a pleasure. I'm so excited about the book being out. And um, if people want to find you or the book, uh, where should they go? Well, uh, sure. Um, the book's available now everywhere, hardback, audio, and um, Kindle, all the, just their favorite retailers. Uh, svpg.com is uh, our website and all, lots of free content. I mean, all the content is free. And um, we are constantly writing our latest thoughts in there. And I'm on Twitter at, at Kagan. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm really glad we got a chance to talk about the book. Thank you very much, Holly. Hey, Holly here. I hope you enjoyed listening to this Smoops episode as much as I enjoyed making it. I wanted to share with you that at East Shore Product Science, we run lots of workshops and we'd love to have you join us. We teach the product science method, a step-by-step process for evaluating product opportunities and laying the foundations for high growth product development. We help product leaders and startup founders identify the right products and features to build and develop the support to do so. We do this at private workshops. We also do it at public workshops, both in person and online. If you'd like to learn more, check it out at h2rproductscience.com slash workshops. The Product Science Podcast is brought to you by H2R Product Science. We teach startup founders and product leaders how to use the product science method to discover the strongest product opportunities and lay the foundations for high growth products, teams, and businesses. Learn more at h2rproductscience.com. Enjoying this episode? Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode. I also encourage you to visit us at productsciencepodcast.com to sign up for more information and resources from me and our guests. If you like the show, a rating and review would be greatly appreciated. Thank you.